Ну, не учиться. А ты не можешь. Ты должен слушать. Ты знаешь, как будет окунь по латыни? Я сегодня утром узнал, угадает кого. Перка. И он меня забрался на завтраке. Называется перка лицеон. Окей, so maybe we'll start. And so I'm happy to announce Stanislav Smirnov, who will tell us about two deeper collections revisited. Oh. <laughs> Well, thanks uh, very much for the invitation. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and uh, uh, it's certainly a pleasure to celebrate birthdays of uh, my two of some of my favorite colleagues. Uh, and I think it's, it's uh, I thought it's the first time I was somewhere for 100th birthday, uh, but uh, actually I realized that I was for 100th birthday of Institute Metacle Fleur. So, <laughs> but Metacle Fleur, those are, this is one person, not, uh, not two. Uh, but then I actually learned that the correct name of institute is not Institute of Metacle Fleur, but Institute of Metacle Fleurs. So it's of Metacle Fleur and his wife. So in, in principle, wow. Well, you don't see it in English or in Swedish, but uh, like in Russian, it should be Institute Metacle Fleur of. Uh, well, uh, so happy, happy birthday. Now, uh, my s small problem is that the title of the conference is Quantum Structures in Algebra and Geometry, and most of my life I've studied classical structures in analysis. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, at one point I sort of started slowly drifting there, so eventually maybe I reach it. Uh, uh, and uh, I a bit contemplated uh, speaking of something more, more quantum today, but decided instead to give a sort of an expository talk, uh, which is of course uh, a bit difficult because some, well, there are a few people in the room who know this subject as, as well as I do, and some people who know better yet. Uh, but I, I will just uh, sort of try to give some expository thing about percolation to D and end up with some uh, quantum connections. And now the, the talk will have uh, two parts. Uh, uh, less quantum part and even even less quantum part. So the first one is less quantum and it's uh, about to the percolation how it was before conformal field theory kicked in. Uh, so it's it's a just a, a geometric model in statistical physics uh, and uh, usually when people want an archetypical model in Euclidean uh, space they speak about the Ising model which was uh, introduced into serious mathematical literature in 28 by a Lenz student of Ising well before before percolation kicked in. Uh, and Ising model studies, studies random coverings of the plane or any other lattice uh, which represents spins, uh, uh, spins of uh, atoms in some lattice and uh, they try to align the neighbor so you, you assume that uh, the uh <coughs> that uh, interaction decays very fast and only neighbors interact and then you study how many like white spins are versus black spins. So percolation in that sense is much easier you just randomly cover lattice. You toss a coin, maybe a biased coin for every side or every vertex or every placket, so there are three types of models, uh, side percolation, face or placket percolation and both percolation and in a sense side and face it's the same, you just pass to a dual lattice. And of course, if you just toss a coin, then there is no sense in studying magnetization and studying uh, how many white spins you have. You easily get, get, <laughs> get, get the number. And now, uh, uh, what you study, you study connectivity probabilities. Uh, in principle, you can also study it uh, in the usual Ising model. I'll say a few words about this later. Uh, so uh, you can think of it as, uh, for example, a map of a city, say, say a rectangular city, in this case, say, Manhattan. Uh, where every every piece of the road uh, along one block is randomly closed or open with probability p open with probability one minus p closed and you ask whether you can pass from top to bottom it's sort of clear when p is zero you cannot pass at all everything is closed when p is small uh, if you draw computer experience you immediately see that you cannot pass top to bottom and when p is large you can and then uh, the interesting thing which happens uh, it's not totally obvious uh, mathematically, but for a physicist it's sort of totally obvious that it should be phase transition, that you don't get a continuous change of first picture into the second, but rather there is a sharp transition at some Curie temperature, some way LPC, that before you with big probability cannot pass, afterwards with high probability you can pass. Uh, and on square bond, for example, there are 
fairly easy arguments. We'll see them in a minute uh, that this critical value is uh, 0.5. But for example, if you do the same thing on uh, faces of square lattice or sides, uh, well, here you actu actually should, should sort of tell if you do it, for example, on faces like, like here, then uh, what, what I assume here that from a face you can pass to four neighbors, up, down, left, right, not, not ac across the diagonal. If you have across the diagonal, it's, it's a different model. So he here, if you run computer experiments, you immediately see that PC is bigger than one half. It's about 0.59, and there are people who use some clever methods and supercomputers to calculate it up to 13 digits after the decimal, even, I think, 17. Uh, and uh, it seems like this is uh, some random transcendental number. It's not, uh, doesn't look like any, any reasonable number at all. And uh, of course, uh, from the point of view of physics, it's not important, uh, like we are not really interested in the value of uh, Curie temperature in the precise value, like it, it would be uh, whatever, like for, for iron it would be 1043 degrees uh, Kelvin grade, uh, and uh, there are some zinc alloys for which it's uh, 100 degrees Celsius, so it's, it's some different number. You are more interested in how this phase transition comes to be. Now, um, one of the things you can do, you can plot uh, the value, the probability, how it changes with speed, that there is a crossing. So it's, it's, uh, you just run all the possible pictures. Uh, if, uh, if it's a square 20 by 20, there are, two to the there are 400 sites, so there are 2 to the power 400 possible pictures. Each of them has some monomial in p times 1 minus p uh, as a probability, uh, and each of them, either you have a crossing or you don't have a crossing. So you sum, and you get some polynomial of p as the probability of a having a crossing of a given shape. Uh, now, uh, what happens is that if you, would, for example, here the probability of crossing a square is plotted by, for squares, I think, 10 by 10, 20 by 20, and 40 by 40, that you always get a smooth curve. It's a polynomial. Uh, you all, it's always increasing. That's fairly clear, because the more the probability to be open, then the more the probability that you will be to, to drive through Manhattan north to south. Uh, but uh, polynomials are of higher and higher degree, because the size changes, and the uh, degree of the polynomial is, is, is essentially the area of the box. And turns out that they basically approximate the step function. They get closer and closer. And for physicists, it's clear, for mathematicians, it took uh, uh, quite some time to prove, and it was fairly technically involved. Uh, and the jump is uh, at different values for different lattices. For example, as I said, square bond is 0.5, triangular side is 0.5, those are the theorems. Uh, and 0.5 comes from some duality. And for triangular bond, it's 2 sine pi over 18. That, that seems like a funny number, but actually, what happens is that uh, if you draw uh, dual lattice to triangular lattice on bonds, uh, then uh, you get uh, percolation on bonds for hexagonal lattice. And hexagonal lattice can be related to triangular by star triangle transformation. And star triangle transformation, you can check, it changes the probabilities by some cubic polynomial. So what you get uh, here is that by duality that the critical P should be root of some cubic polynomial. I think p cubed minus 3p plus 1 equal to 0. And it turns out that this is exactly this number. But there are some models where it's some fractional. Another theorem was that uh, to see phase transition in this model, you needed to pass to a limit in the size of the box. But you can cheat. You can immediately build in the limit in your model. Instead of considering finite Manhattan, you consider infinite Manhattan, so infinite uh, lattice. And you ask, what is the chance that you can escape from 0? What is the probability that from 0 you can drive all the way to infinity? It's clear that for any value of p, it's more than 1. Because for any value of p, there is always probability that there will be circuit of closed, uh, the, there, is, uh, there are a number of closed intersections around which don't allow you to pass. It's clear that it's increasing. It's clear that eventually it reaches 1. Uh, so what uh, happens there, that if you draw this picture, what is the probability of reaching the size r? then it behaves much like the previous one. But in the limit for size infinity, you get that it's identically 0. And then it continuously goes up as some fractional power of uh, uh, p minus critical probability. So uh, what everything I said, it's a uh, theorem for those lattices, but quite a technical one. And it took like uh, efforts of many people to do it. And uh, those were long technically, both technically evolved and ideologically evolved papers. Uh, now, uh, maybe before I, I say a few words about the proofs, a uh, few words, why do you have to study these problems? 
so uh, what we will speak about is about critical percolation. As I said, it's, it's kind of a uh, very specific regime, uh, P bigger than PC, everything uh, you can drive almost everywhere. P smaller than PC, you cannot drive at all. Why PC is interesting if it's so rare? So it, uh, well, this is, for example, uh, there are four values of, uh, five values of P here. So this one is critical, and you see where you can drive from the, from the, some site in the middle. So for P smaller than PC, you, there is just a very small region of the city which, which you can, uh, uh, Discover uh, for critical P there is some fractal, but for P bigger than PC, it's it's basically the whole the whole city minus a few holes. So what happens is that uh, if you study this problem, for example, you're driving through the city or you are burning a forest where the role of uh, P play played is played by how far by constants like how far are trees from each other and how dry is the climate at this time of season. So what happens is that if P bigger than PC. Uh, and you burn the forest, everything burns. Or if you drive, you can drive through. If P is more than PC, you immediately stop. In a real life city or forest, P fluctuates. So when you drive or burn the forest, you stop at some place which is approximately PC. So what happens is that, for example, if you, and I mean, this is a real statement, if you take uh, uh, pictures of forest fires uh, taken from an airplane, uh, then uh, uh, of course it can stop at straight line if it burns all the way to the railroad or to the cost, and it's not cost of Norway, but say cost of uh, Massachusetts. Uh, but uh, if it stops in the middle of the forest, it stops along, along some fractal line because it stops in the region where P is approximately PC, and you, you get this, this fractal picture, more about it later. And there are many other models. Uh, it's, it's actually interesting, the first time I see so, there was this uh, Russians in the audience know, and I'm sure uh, Pasha and Andrei have read uh, this series of books. There was, uh, it was called Library of Quant Magazine. It's a magazine for high school children in Russia, and it has like 50-something uh, volumes. And there was a volume in 1982 which says Physics and Geometry of Disorder. And there is, you see the picture of uh, forest burning. And there are, there are, for example, here pictures from that book, uh, which is a clusterization of, of gold. Uh, and again, you see similar pictures. Now, this is... Uh, this is a uh, computer model of erosion, and this is a real picture of erosion where you put a drop of acid on something, a uh, film of, I think, aluminum on the glass, and you see how, how it's, it's eaten through. Uh, now, uh, we pass back to the uh, percolation model. Uh, so we take uh, uh, phase percolation hexagonal lattice because you get uh, nicer pictures there, and also because we can prove more theorems there. So you toss a coin for every side, and you cover it yellow or white uh, with probability one half, and you think that it's a yellow rock with white holes. And you ask uh, whether you can walk, whether your liquid can seep through white holes from top to bottom. So here you can, for example, go, 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 no, okay, go, go, go. So you can reach through. Well, it's, it's a good test of your vision, whether you can see the, the path in the second one. Uh, so actually in this one there is none, so, uh, uh, and, um, <coughs> In this model, you actually see, uh, yeah, this, this also, if you relate it to Ising model, it's Ising model at infinite temperature where you don't, uh, there is no interaction between neighbors. And here you see sort of the main uh, property which was behind the theorems I mentioned, and it's a duality property, so it's unique to, to a plane and it's unique uh, to a number of lattices in the form of self-duality. You always have duality on the plane, but some lattices are self-dual. So uh, there is a vertical crossing in one cover, if and only if there is no vertical cro horizontal crossing in another cover. So there is a vertical blue crossing, if and only if there is no yellow obstruction across. So this is actually related. There is a famous ga game of hex, uh, which was invented by Peter Haig in Denmark and then reinvented two years later by John Nash in Princeton. And in Princeton common room, I think they still have a, a cardboard board uh, which, which they used to play. So the game of hex, you put uh, uh, hexagons of two colors, say yellow and blue, on a board. And the first, and it's, it's a rhombic board, uh, and the first player wins if he has a horizontal yellow crossing, and the second wins if he has a vertical blue crossing. So this observation says that at the end of the game, exactly one player will win. So both cannot win because you can't have both yellow vertical and blue horizontal, and at least one of those will be. Because if you start pouring liquid and it doesn't reach the bottom, then there will be an abstraction, which you just take the lowest level of the liquid, and this will form an abstraction. Uh, actually, actually, there is a square like this version, which is called bridge. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's on uh, the ch paper, which is uh, convenient, uh, convenient and boring lectures when I was a student. Uh, 
So why didn't you go into percolation? Well, I also read this. I did read this book, and I, I, I read this book in particular yeah. when I was a student. Uh, this, this actually book was, uh, was before, all, 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 before all these theorems. So these yeah. theorems, they appeared like five years after this book was, well, uh, they start appearing at the time when this book were published. At the time, those were really big results by Zinman and Barsky and Menshikov and then Grimmett and others and very technically evolved. Uh, and uh, in principle, uh, you can do the same thing, for example, if you do the same thing on bonds uh, on square lattice. Then, then what happens is that uh, uh, if you draw open bonds on a square lattice, then the uh, good thing would be to draw uh, the closed bonds on a dual lattice. So we should do, do a picture like that. So when whenever, uh, so it, it, it each place, you either you draw on dual lattice blue bond or black bond on, on the original lattice. So uh, uh, thus, uh, everything I'm going to say, you can do for, for the square lattice and bonds, but it will be slightly more complicated because dual lattice is shifted by one half, so we have to, to be careful with accounting in some place. Uh, okay, so where were we? Uh, so there are these things. Uh, so there is this observation that uh, either you always have either this event or that event. Uh, so probability of this event is 1 minus probability of this event. If here the p was probability of blue cow, then probability of yellow cow is 1 minus p. Now set p to 1 half, p and 1 minus p are the same, so we get formula that probability at 1 half is 1 minus probability at 1 half of the same event. If you have symmetric shape, you can flip. So you get that for symmetric shape at p equal 1 half, probability is 1 half. And it's a strong indication that it should be the critical value because you get that there for some shape, it's exactly this middle probability. So it should be at 1 half. Now, of course, you have to prove that for bigger p, it tends to 1. For smaller p, it tends to 0. And um, uh, there are, so what, 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 what I will do, I will do here uh, this in, in two steps. It, it's, it's quite interesting because if you look at the original papers, they are quite lengthy. And at the time, for example, that's, uh, this picture of the graph, it took, uh, so if, if you, for example, open Grimmett's book on percolation, which is the main textbook reference, there are like three or four big books. There is one by Harry Keston, there are a couple by physicists. So it takes three chapters and a total of 90 pages to prove this. So we'll do it in the next 10 slides. So it's, it's actually can now be done in 10 minutes. And in some sense, maybe it's good that first uh, difficult proofs appeared because they explain many more things. But now it's rather straightforward and the first is that we want from this estimate that for a symmetric shape probability is one half, get estimates, maybe bad ones, for arbitrary shapes. So uh, there is an easy observation that if you start with some elongated shape, then you can have uh, much more elongated shapes uh, in a very well easy way. So for example, here uh, there is a, so suppose we, know we can estimate a rectangle one by two probability of a crossing. And we want to estimate rectangle one by four. So we cover it by a chain of rectangles one by two, which snake through it. In this case, there are 13 of them. And uh, probability that there is this crossing is at least the probability that each of these 13 is crossed. Because each of these 13 is crossed, they will overlap, uh, and you get, get this chain. Uh, so here I use something which is almost clear. It uh, somehow needs a proof, but uh, we'll see later why the proof is easy, is that uh, these crossing events are positively correlated. So if, if uh, this is crossed, and then you calculate for the second one probability it's crossed. It will only increase because you're already conditioned on having some blue cow, so it's only easier to cross. So it's, it's clear, but a priori it requires a proof. And for models like Ising models, such statements there, uh, so the Montanisti inequalities, FK inequalities, uh, uh, they call they uh, FKG inequalities, they quote uh, uh, for Ising models with interaction, they sometimes are difficult to prove, and some for some models they're absent, but for this model, because it's uh, local and there is no interaction, it's easy. So uh, this basically says that if we have estimate for something which is 1 by 2 or even 1 by 1.1, we are done because we can do any shape. And if we can do any shape, uh, some a priori estimates, then it's much easier to, to sort of study these crossing probabilities. Uh, but the problem is that uh, this proof requires our shape to be non-symmetric. It requires it to be elongated in one direction. So how to go around it? Uh, so what I will just prove in three minutes is that if you have any shape, uh, rectangular shape, 
uh, then probability and probability of crossing it is a then probability of crossing twice longer shape is at least a square over 16. so it's a very rough estimate you can actually do better uh, and, but I only will use one lattice symmetry that you can uh, sort of reflect with respect to vertical axis. So first we start with the probability of this crossing being A. Now what we do, we choose the lowest crossing possible. So we go to the lowest crossing. It's the same as we take uh, dual cover yellow and start from below and uh, see where it stops. So it's the lowest. So the lowest crossing depends only on the area below it. So we can play with the area above. So you see, we got this crossing, but we can we still have like uh, uh, one rectangle and a half to play with. Now what I do, I make a symmetric image of this, and now I have this symmetric rectangular shape, which will have either this crossing or this crossing with probability one half. So I use for this like butterfly type shape, vertical symmetry. So a probability of this crossing is equal to probability of this crossing, so they are both one half. So I get that the probability of this crossing was A, probability of adding this one is one half. So probability of having such crossing is A over two. Now uh, this crossing can land in the, on the right side or on the top side. And probability is A over two. So either probability of landing on the right is A over four or probability of landing on top is A over four at least or both. So uh, the first case is, is very easy if it's this probability is at least a over 4, then it's at least a square over 16 because a is more than 1. So we proved our theorem. Now, the second case is slightly more difficult, but we again play the same game. We uh, move it uh, to the left upper corner. So we choose the blue crossing, which is the closest to this point. And it only depends on the area above, so we can play with this area again. And we can play with this area, and uh, A over 4 is probability of having this, and A over 4 is probability of having a part of symmetric in the reflected hexagon. If you have both this and this, you can join them and you have a crossing. So it's at least a square over 16. And uh, this is really kind of a high school combinatoric, so you can explain it easier to someone in the last two grades of school. And it's, it's kind of peculiar that people, the original proofs were, were much more evolved. Now, uh, what took 90 pages after that is to prove that you have this sharpness of phase transition, which is uh, clear for physicists. For physicists, it's clear that you always either have zero probability of crossing or you have probability one of crossing, and then there is a jump. So I, I, I will do it, and I need uh, uh, one definition. Uh, you say that uh, a site is pivotal if changing it changes the event. So for example, for a crossing, being pivotal uh, amounts to having two blue arms and two yellow arms. So for example, what, uh, what uh, happens here? There is, a there is no crossing, there is a yellow obstruction. But to this hexagon, there are two blue arms, and if I flip it, then I have a blue crossing. So this hexagon is called pivotal for, for this event, for the crossing event. And uh, I should observe that there might be several pivotal sites. For example, in this picture, there are at least two pivotal sites, both the left one and the right one, if flipped, they, they lead to a crossing. So there is a, a theorem which is called russo margulis rem So Russo was mainly in percolation, and Margulis used it in a different setting. So that's Margulis, the Margulis. Uh, and uh, it's, it's very clear. It says that probability, if you change p, the derivative in p of probability of event, in the expected number of pivotal points. And essentially, it's clear, because if you change p, uh, you can uh, do it by just you increase p and you flip hexagons once in a while. So what, for example, uh, one way you can do it, you can toss not a coin for every hexagon, but you can toss, uh, you can run a random number generator, which produces number between 0 and 1 for every hexagon. So it's a more complicated model. Each hexagon state is a number between 0 and 1. And then for a given p, you say that the hexagons are uh, blue if their number is smaller than p. And then when you increase once in a while, you pass some hexagon which has exactly the value of p, you flip it, and if it's pivotal, you gain your event. So it's, it's, it's a fairly clear uh, lemma. You, the only thing you can, you should check here that uh, it's zero probability, almost zero probability event, that two hexagons, uh, they are flipped at the same time. But since they are real values, then that, that never happens. So this is, uh, this is a lemma. Uh, and uh, so for our particular case, uh, probability, derivative of probability of crossing is expected number of such sites. 
and we want to estimate it and uh, we want uh, to get uh, that uh, this derivative is almost zero then it jumps and then it's again almost zero uh, so first uh, to have this event we need a horizontal yellow crossing so probability of horizontal yellow crossing is well not at least it's exactly one minus probability of vertical so it's uh, we have this now uh, we have to have a pivotal uh, let's choose the lowest yellow crossing and the lowest yellow crossing it's uh, exactly borders the area which from below can be reached by blue so to get a pivotal point it's sufficient to find the blue crossing from the top and probability of blue crossing from the top it's a probability of crossing uh, not a square but part of a square so it's bigger than probability of crossing of a square so probability of finding one pivotal is at least we already had one minus px and times px so uh, this is an estimate for probability of having one pivotal and you see already it kind of uh, signifies interesting thing that we have one minus px times px so if px is small then this estimate is small. If px is close to 1, the estimate is also small. So basically, that's the root of why our probability is very close to 0, then it jumps to 1, and then again, uh, it's very close to 1, because the estimate on its derivative will be close to 0 when it's close to 0 or when it's close to 1. So we only have to prove that in between, the derivative is high. So. Uh, this formula doesn't tell us that in the between derivative is high. It only tells that in between 0 and 1, the probability is at least 1 or something. But we only calculated chance of having one pivotal. We should show that there are many pivotals in between. And that, that I, I will do now. Uh, so suppose uh, we have this pivotal. We choose again the leftmost crossing. And we can still play with this sector. So what we do, we do a few concentric anuli here. So in this case, I decided to change them to square annuli. Or on hexagonal edges, they should be like hexagonal type annuli. Uh, and uh, how many annuli of the same modulus we can draw on a n by n box? Logarithm n. And what Russo Samuel Welsh tells us? That each of these annuli has probability at least c of having a crossing. So it's, it's why we needed Russo Samuel Welsh. So we have here annuli of the same shape. So regardless of the size, we can prove by Russo Samuel Welsh that there is a definite bound on probability. So there is logarithmic number of them. Each has at least C probability of crossing. So we get the estimate that uh, expected number of uh, pivotal points at least 1 minus Px times Px times logarithm n. So we get an estimate that our function derivative is at least this function times 1 minus this function times a very big number of logarithm n. So essentially, that's what says that either function is close to 0, or it's close to 1, or uh, it grows very fast. It doesn't have other choice. So essentially, what I proved is that uh, the graph of this function can be uh, put inside a zigzag strip of which 1 over log n. And uh, it's, it's really interesting because uh, the proof of this statement, if you look at Grimmett's book, it takes three chapters. So it's, uh, he actually does a little bit more. Uh, he does exponential decay of correlations, but that can be deduced from uh, this. And uh, Hugo de Minio and Van Santacion, they discovered also a three-page way to deduce it from, from similar arguments. Now, I did 1 over log n, but in fact, uh, it's much better. It's n to some power. And uh, in an easy way, uh, well, OK, in one page way, I can do any power. But in fact, it's, it's a power which in the second part of the talk one can be calculated. Now, uh, so that's the first part, which is further away for quantum things. So I, uh, there are some open questions. So we still don't know how to do models which are not self-dual. And, uh, three-dimensional thing is very 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 wide open because if you do crossing in dimension three then abstraction is not a crossing but a film so it's it's a kind of a surface uh, and uh, so the percolation model is do, do to a model which has some surfaces in it at this at this time of course someone in the audience asked can you study four-dimensional percolation with two-dimensional crossings because two plus two is equal four and yes you can there are some papers about it but uh, Nothing really like super exciting, but uh, there are some interesting things. Uh, and uh, then there are many things I, 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 I have not uh, touched upon. And uh, uh, maybe the most closest to this thing, so it's, it's um, mm, uh, so Boris Cyrilson has introduced an object which he called black noise. Uh, 
uh, or other black noises. Uh, so white noise is a noise uh, whose spectrum is just uniformly distributed. You see everything. And black noise is a noise where there is no spectrum at all. So what does it mean? It's, it's a noise, so it's a random field, so it's Fox spaces and all that, so it's an object from quantum mechanics, but which you cannot detect by, by any linear function. So harmonic oscillator doesn't see this. Uh, and uh, so he constructed this object on a line, uh, and he uh, conjectured that percolation on a, on a plane would be such an object, which, which we, with Adet Schramm, proved. Uh, now, uh, so this, this is sort of an interesting point. So if you look at percolation as a spin model, uh, yellow and blue spins, and properly normalize, then you just get white noise. So you, you get some, or you, you, well, usually you get nothing, but you can carefully randomize the good white noise, but it's not an interesting model. Now suppose you look at percolation as a model where you have some information at every site, and uh, you look at connection probabilities. So that's your sigma algebra of events is connection probabilities. So uh, the question, can you pass to a limit? On a lattice you can do it, but is a object in a plane where at every point you have a bit of information, and in the end you end up storing only connection probabilities? And the answer is yes, there is such an object. And uh, well, the interesting question, what, what would be the quantum structures related to it? Uh, so it, it took actually quite some ingenuity in constructing it. So it's, it was a paper where we sort of found there was a gap in our proof which was moving from one place to another. It's like, like a bubble under a tabletop, uh, but eventually sort of everything is fine. Uh, but the interesting is, is it, so it's, it's kind of what we construct is an object which falls into the usual axiomatics of quantum mechanics, but cannot be detected by linear functionals. So as Gil Kalai has, has joked, maybe that's the explanation for the dark matter. But uh, well, that's, that's sort of a very heretical joke. Now, I mentioned the quantum uh, uh, book, uh, but the interesting thing that in American Mathematical Monthly, this problem was posed long before in 1894. So this is actually 1894. You can actually see what kind of problems school children were doing in 1894. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually a good, good pedagogical question. Why, why in school magazine in 1894 there were such problems and uh, they are not there anymore? Why? Well, okay, the answer is just uh, how many, uh, what is the percentage of uh, people in US or Russia or France who graduate from high school in 1894? It's about 10. 10, 15, well, it depends in, on the country. So uh, basically, the last year of high school at the time was b like a first year of university. So that's the difference. Also, it was 10 years before Henri Lebeck, so you had to do uh, multiple integrals. You couldn't integrate with respect to area. And uh, well, yeah, that's it. So that's, that's, that's the problem. So it's uh, uh, that you have a box of uh, five by 50 by 30 of uh, 1,500 uh, white and black balls. Calculate the probability that there is a crossing. And then he says, we start with assuming that crossing should be a straight line, not a fractal like we have seen. And then even that number they get wrong. That's, that's actually amazing. But then the writer know that this solution is not entirely satisfactory. Uh, and uh, we, we, we will welcome a correct one. The integral, right. Uh, well, you can do it if you are bored. Uh, uh, yeah. So now uh, the second part is uh, sort of close to quantum, and it's after conformal field theory. Uh, so here, uh, uh, essentially, well, first it started with Stuckelberg and the theory of normalization, which became theory of renormalization. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, so that, that uh, came as an explanation why, why you should have some fractional dimensions in scale-free theories in physics. Uh, and uh, basically what you do, so that's, that's the picture, I think it's from one of Ken Wilson's or Mike Fisher's articles that you take Ising model and then you run sort of a democracy exercise that you take districts four by four and each of them has a vote and uh, majority wins and you get a new lattice which is, uh, which is uh, where step is uh, changed by a factor of four. Uh, and uh, you lose some information, obviously. There is no, uh, there are some artificial models where st the partition function is the same, but here, no, it's not the same. And certainly you lose degrees of freedom. That's the goal to make models simpler. And then there is some hand waving argument saying that uh, you change the scale of the lattice, but you also change uh, the 
easing temperature or coefficient p in percolation. And then when you do it repeatedly, what should happen is that uh, critical point should arise, or Curie point should arise as a fixed point of this transformation. So this is actually a picture of what happens if you do the same ma majority thing for percolation. Obviously, majority thing for percolation doesn't work rigorously. Because uh, what, it can what can happen is that uh, only 10% of roads in every square are open, but still they connect very well and you can pass through. And with this model, of course, if you, if you do 10%, then you very quickly you get, uh, you get that everything is closed. But uh, what, uh, what happens is that, uh, strangely enough, it works fairly well that if you make an assumption that uh, renormalizing changes the scale by a factor of 4 in the O2 or whatever, and then also changes P, you get this picture that there is a whole space of models, percolation models, or easing models, and then there are these renormalization group flows, and then uh, the interesting points, uh, uh, they arise as a fixed points of this. So everything closed and everything open, they arise to some attracting points on the borderline of this guy. Uh, and the point, uh, the critical percolation point, there is some saddle point in the middle. So, uh, uh, and then uh, what happened uh, is that, uh, well, first uh, Kadanov uh, observed that if you have scale rotation invariance, you can deduce certain things on top of it. Uh, then uh, Polyakov postulated inversion invariance and deduced one more correlation. And then with Belavin and Zamalochikov, he postulated full conformal invariance. And uh, from that, uh, they start deducing exponents, and particularly for percolation and easing, uh, Cardi deduced all of them. And in a sense, also mathematically, Cardi's paper is more satisfactory because he, well, it wasn't important for percolation, but it was important for easing. He deals with the boundary conditions. And uh, in Polyakov's paper, he is rather sloppy with that. So he just says that, uh, you know, we take part of easing model, we map it conformally, we get part of easing model, but that certainly should depend on what are the boundary conditions there. And uh, that, that was worked out by John Cardi. Now, um, if you go back to the, to the usual probability, there is one famous example of conformal invariance, so that was proved by Paul Levy. I don't think there is any paper. It's, he just, it's in his lecture notes of the course he gave it a call normal. Uh, and uh, random walk, if you map it, obviously is not conformally invariant because the square lattice here is mapped to some curvilinear lattice by exponential transformation. But if you look at the places where the lattice step is small, the pictures look almost the same. So what happens is that trajectories of, ra of random walk is meshed on to zero tend to trajectories of brown emotions, and the later are conformally invariant up to time change. So if you shrink, the time starts growing faster. If you if you stretch, it, sta it starts uh, go slower, but uh, but the things are the same. Now, uh, the, is it the related to the fact that Laplace equation two dimensions is conformally? Yes, yes, yes. That's that's so. Actu actually, this in a sense it's uh, indirectly present in the paper of Shizuo Kakutani in uh, uh, 40s. I think it's the time when he was uh, expelled from United States to Japan uh, because he was Japanese national. At, so at the turn of the war, he was expelled to Japan. So he worked for five years there, no, five or six years there. So he has a paper 1941 or 42, uh, where he says that uh, a Brownian motion is related to harmonic function. The exit probability of Brownian motion is exactly the harmonic measure. So that's, so you, ca you can do it from that way. But then, then there is there is also a proof proof of Paul Levy. Well, it's, you can see, but it's 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 indeed this. It's indeed relation to Laplacian. Uh, and uh, uh, what happened is that, uh, well, much like Kutani did it uh, indirectly before, mm, mm, before Paul Levy, uh, the were physicists who were doing conformal field theory before it existed. So, for example, Nienhaus and Denise, they did conformal field theory before Belay and Polyakov the Mawachikov paper because they reduced some observables for latest models to uh, some functionals of a free field, which is conformally invariant. So indirectly, they, 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 they had that. And then they had this sort of uh, wonderful calculation. So for example, that Hausdorff dimension of percolation cluster is 91 over 48. The Hausdorff dimension of crossing is 4 thirds. So what does it mean that it's 4 thirds? If you have box 1,000 by 1,000, it means that the leftmost crossing will have approximately 1,000 to the power of 4 thirds uh, hexagons. Now 1,000 to the power of 4 thirds is 10,000. So you have a 1,000 size box. But to cross it, it, you need to make 10,000 steps. That's it's very hard. Uh, thus, it's very hard to trace with your naked eye because it's very, very wiggly. 
And if you have million by million box, well, first you, can, you won't see it on the screen, uh, but uh, the individual pixels. But million to the power of thirds is uh, 100 million. So it's 100 times more uh, longer, so it's very, very hard to trace. And then at the time it was sort of, uh, it seeped a little bit into math literature, but uh, people were too bewildered by these things. And then uh, they made even more predictions. So for example, what I was saying, there is, this is a picture of probability that you can go from zero to infinity. So physicists said that first it's a continuous phase transition, so it's zero and then it grows continuously, there is no jump. Uh, and th this is actually a big problem. It's uh, in 3D, it's wide open. So if you prove that phase transition for percolation in 3D is uh, continuous, or at least you find some sort of good mathematical explanation without proof, it would be quite an achievement. And for the Ising model, uh, this is a very recent theorem by Michael Eisenman, Ugodi Mini, Kupan, and uh, Vlada Sidarevichus from like four years ago that for Ising model in 2D, it's continuous. So physicists apparently, so they knew that it should be because that's what you observe in nature, but there was no even good physics argument showing that. And it's, it's if you tell this to a physicist, he will argue, but then he will go to read uh, his literature and then he will return back and say, oh really, we didn't, we just took it for granted by, from natural observations. Uh, so, uh, so what uh, physicists predicted is that uh, this power, but so this be, be, this here increases like a fractional power, five over thirty-six. So it's this kind of graph, and many, many, many other things. Again, in dimension three, uh, the current uh, underst physical understanding is that those numbers are uh, you don't have conformal field theory, so those numbers are some irrational numbers, uh, and that there is no way to calculate them. Of course, it doesn't mean that there is no way to there is no formula because there are some. You can very well think that, like, say, for example, you prove that uh, whatever number nu is the third eigenvalue of Laplacian on the sphere. So it will give you some fractional number, and it will be as good as an answer for mathematician, but it won't give you like 43 over 18 or, or something. So in principle, it's not excluded that there are exact formulas, but what people are sure of that they are not rational, and what people are sure of that we don't have any idea how to do it today. Yeah, well, yeah, okay, not on the sphere or like on top. Yeah, that's, 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 that's a bad thing that this, uh, this only mean field experience would be. <laughs> well, yeah, that, uh, but what the other examples? I don't know, values of gamma functions at uh, multiples of pi. Uh, <laughs> in the German. Actually, I, I have a, a more serious question. So, yes. So, uh, the fra uh, in when you learn about fractals, the simplest examples like uh, Cox, Nopoli, Cantor, Seth, and so on, they have other dimensions which are irrational numbers, which are like log three or uh, log two over log three or something like that. And these uh, happen to be rational numbers. So is there an explanation why you're rational? It comes from some kind of minimality. Or something. Yes. Uh, well, it's, 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 it's actually not, you don't have to have minimality to have rational yes. numbers, but basically you have a, you, you have a multi-parameter set of models. Essential, really interesting, if you have scale free, there is one parameter, which uh, some people call central charge, some people call Schramm's parameter kappa. Now it turns out that uh, uh, these all exponents, they are some uh, quadratic uh, functions, rational functions of kappa, or, or of C if that matters. And it turns out that uh, uh, interesting values of kappa are integers. So for example, kappa equals six, it's percolation, kappa equals three, it's Ising model. And kappa equal two is loop raised random walk, and kappa equal four is Gaussian free field. So you have nice formula, you plug in nice integers, you get nice rational answers. Uh, and that sort of goes even beyond, a little bit beyond. So from point of view, SL calculations, I can, if time permitting, I can show how calculations are done. Mm, there you don't care about algebraic structure, just work with some PDE and uh, you use this kind of uh, Frobenius approach and uh, you get, uh, when there are nice parameters, you get nice, nice, nice powers. Uh, Well, uh, look, look, uh, so what, let, let me just go uh, very straight. Uh, yeah, so, so for physicists, uh, uh, the way physicists were getting these numbers as weights in Verasor representation is entirely rigorous. Mm -hmm. Now, what uh, was completely 
mysterious at the time why uh, these Verasor representations have anything whatsoever to do with percolation or easing model. Uh, to the point uh, that, uh, I mean, me and my friends, I'm sure Rick also tried that, that you would take like physics review letters paper on four pages and try to split it into like 10 lemmas, which you can try to prove. And then you can't even split it in 10 steps, which you can formulate even to that point. So it's, uh, uh, now I think we know better. So we, we, if we go back to old papers, uh, physics papers, we can formulate a sequence of five lemmas, which all we are sure are like beyond reasonable doubt correct, but just we don't know how to prove. And in some cases we can even prove. So, so for easing model, it, it worked out now fairly rigorously by, uh, so we started with Clemon, but then with by Clemon Angler and uh, Dima Chilkak uh, and Kosti Europe, they, they worked out it uh, to, the, to the last details and can do, much more than physicists can do, so they can figure out some exponents and some constants which uh, which were beyond the reach of the usual CFT. Uh, so uh, is it now more clear uh, what, so you get some particular, so there is a hyperbola which uh, responds to uh, the Rastora Verma module having a singular vector of uh, degree two, uh, which is the way our SLE lives, right? Yeah. Then uh, there are some particular points which are special, which correspond to some models that you mentioned, on this hyperbola. I, so you have a reducible representation of Verasora sitting there. Does it have any special properties uh, from uh, you know, representation theoretic point of view uh, that uh, makes, it, uh, makes this point special to SLE? Uh, so let's, let's go a little bit fast then. Uh, so Schramm, uh, so he uh, suggested, well at the time he thought that it's too difficult to study the covering of the plane. In the end, we, we construct the scaling limit, and that it was too easy to study the crossing probability. And that, but then again, we, we did it eventually. So he suggested to study interface between uh, black uh, and white on this picture, yellow, blue on my picture. So a uh, myopic end goes up, and you get, uh, using left hand rule, you get a random broken line. You pass to a scaling limit, you get a random fractal curve. And if you believe physics, it's a random conformally invariant curve. Now, uh, so, uh, 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 there is a Lovner equation which tells you that a slit, uh, if you parameterize it by time t and you take a conformal objective which opens it, then it's actually governed by one parameter wt and this nonlinear equation, which is very difficult to solve because it's nonlinear. But essentially, you imagine it like you drive a car in a hyperbolic space, and wt is how you turn the steering wheel. Uh, and uh, what Schramm proved is that if you uh, believe physics and you believe that these interfaces are conformally invariant, then they are all given by uh, Wt, which is a Brownian motion, square a couple of Bt. So it's, so it's, it's kind of like uh, interfaces in percolation or domain walls in easing model, they, they kind of represent some random walk on model A space. Well, in this case, it's model A space is trivial because you just have half plane with a two punctured, two distinguished points, zero and infinity, but uh, you can also do it on Riemann surfaces. And then you can calculate numbers with eta calculus. So what happens if you have this equation and you plug in Brown and motion and you can want to calculate some parameter, for example, what is the dimension of this curve? You should just calculate what's the probability that this curve passes within distance of epsilon to some number, which is the probability that under this map, this number collapses fast enough at this point. Uh, this is essentially the problems you solve in financial mathematics class uh, daily. So those of us who teach in business school uh, financial mathematics, then they, they approximate by such equations uh, financial markets, only with real numbers. Here you have complex numbers, so it's two real equations, but it's, it's quite uh, basically the, the usual thing. Now, uh, the question is that here we don't care what is the value of kappa. You can always solve it. But what happens is that for some values, uh, so we get some hypergeometric things as solutions. So for example, uh, this is the probability that the probability that there is a crossing, uh, percolation crossing over rectangle. You can also deduce it from SLE, and this is a hypergeometric function of the modulus. And the numbers one third, two thirds, and four thirds, uh, they are, you get them from number kappa, which in this case is six, and hence you have one third, two thirds, and four thirds. Ah, you, you get it from basically from KZ equation. Yes, well, yeah. Well, you can say that, yeah. But uh, essentially, if you take different values of kappa, there are some values of kappa where this hypergeometric function will become just some, some power, uh, some polynomial, so they are nice. Not, not for this specific model, but for example, if you write the answer for, for the dimension, then uh, that's that, 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 that what will happen. 
so it's I don't know what next to do. Uh, so it's it's uh, yeah, and you you can study these curves. Ah, okay, but I uh, maybe go forward. So forward, yeah, yeah. We are moving forward. Don't worry, don't worry. We're moving forward. And yeah, you you can view this thing as a one-dimensional thing with a time pointing up, and then it becomes actually a quantum model on a line. So we are going up in this imaginary time. Yeah. So. Um, <coughs> So the uh, uh, kind of uh, SLE was jump-started, uh, and this theory of Schramm uh, was jump-started by uh, John Cardi's deduction of this formula. And what uh, Cardi did uh, for the formula of probability of a crossing, he took point on the boundary and he moved it around uh, the boundary. And he noticed that probability of a crossing is, uh, uh, has some physical meaning, but also its derivative has some physical meaning. They related by Riccati type equation, and that's that's its solution. Uh, so the way uh, <coughs> we proved it, we allowed z to move inside, and we observed that the probability that there is a crossing which separates a and z from c and b is a harmonic function, uh, and it uh, satisfies certain boundary value problem. You can calculate it. So what uh, I can do that that uh, one of the birthday boys already have seen. But I will do it nevertheless, and there will be quiz at the end. Uh, uh, so uh, what we figured out is uh, how to do it much easier. Well, that, that's kind of a funny story. I sent my student out to prove it for square lattice, and instead he uh, devised a 10 times simpler proof for hexagonal lattice. And then he said that he just forgot what I have asked him to do. Uh, and the proof is, is really <coughs> Uh, uh, do, do you see it at the end. Yeah, let's let's forget about it's it. Kind of conformal, uh, it's, a it's it's a conformal model. So it's it's since you believe that it's conformally invariant, you can map to your domain of choice. And Cart's domain of choice is half plane. Ah. And four points you can map to three of them to any point. So we map three of them to zero, one, and infinity. And the force is some point m. So it's probability of crossing between these two arcs. And what Leonard Carlison immediately observed when he saw this formula, that it also gives you a Christopher Schwartz mapping to an equilateral triangle, because uh, these are exactly the slopes of the lines. Yeah, yeah. So this theorem actually, well, or formula says that limit of the probability of a crossing uh, between, uh, no, limit of the probability uh, of a crossing between this uh, and that so this probability tends exactly to L. So if your favorite domain is equilateral triangle, then probability of a crossing is exactly L. And that at the time kind of uh, convinced Schramm and Carlson and myself that it has something to do with the hexagonal lattice. Now, uh, retrospectively, it has nothing to do with hexagonal lattice. You get 60 degrees because parameter is 6. Uh, and uh, it should also work for any other lattice. Just there is some commentarial magic unrelated to this, which works for hexagonal lattice. So this is the percolation model. And first, I observe that what I can do, I can erase all covers and just leave the perimeters. You get the so-called loop model, or fan loop model. Uh, and uh, in this case, all fun. So usual all fan loop model, and uh, you take n to the power number of loops. And then there is a parameter x, x to the power perimeter of loops. So there are two parameters, n and x. Uh, uh, but here is just there is a bijection between these two pictures. Now, uh, there is also interesting that the crossing can be written in terms of this loop. So there is a vertical crossing if this with these boundary conditions that there are four sources, the sources are connected like that. And there is horizontal if they are connected the other way around. So there are this, uh, you, you keep all the important information in the new model. Now, uh, what uh, then happens is that uh, uh, suppose that z is inside, and we want to uh, see probability that there is uh, this cluster which separates a and z from c and b. So it turns out that it is exactly equal to partition function of such picture, that there are three sources on the boundary and one source inside. So this picture, you no longer can fill with covers, because z is a disorder operator. If you walk around it, yellow becomes blue, blue becomes yellow. But uh, uh, what you can do, you can fill this, uh, uh, well, this, this part you can fill with covers, and then you can play with the rest. So this is an observation which is not important for the proof, but it was kind of a motivation that uh, uh, number of these pictures divided by the total number of all the carrings to the power area 
is exactly the probability that the crossing uh, separates A and Z from C and B. So this, 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 this is the picture. Now we can draw three pictures like that. A connected to Z, A connect, uh, Z connected to C, Z connected to B. And uh, let's denote their probabilities by functions HA, HB, and HZ. So these are the three possible functions. Now it's trivial, almost trivial, that the sum of them is equal to 1. Because the sum of them is total number of all possible pictures. If you have three, if you have four sources, A, C, B, and Z, there are three ways to connect them. So that that's, uh, means that the sum is equal to 1. So we already found something conformally invariant in percolation, because we found a harmonic function, uh, a function which is identically 1. But that's not, not very good. We want some non-trivial harmonic function. And then uh, the next way to symmetrize it is to uh, multiply them by uh, roots of unity. So we, we take these uh, three functions, H, H, B, and C, uh, which uh, on this slide somehow became F. Uh, and uh, no, they haven't become F yet. Uh, let's say, uh, uh, yeah. So we, we take function F, which sum of H, A, H, B, and H, C with coefficients 1, tau, and tau square, where tau is cube root of unity. And it turns out that this function f is a discrete analytic function. Discrete analytic in the following sense. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the sense. So you have a function defined uh, on, on edges uh, or on vertices, doesn't matter. If it's on edges, then you can say that it's discrete analytic if such sum is equal to 0. Because such sum, it's more or less like a contour integral along this blue contour, because this uh, vector is i, this is i times cube root of unity, and this is i times another cube root of unity. So this is uh, the contour integral multiplied by i. And uh, a small remark, if you know this relation at every vertex and you uh, do all these uh, small uh, contour integrals and then you erase things which cancel out, then you get a big contour integral. So if for some function you have uh, this property uh, everywhere, then you deduce that the contour sums of these functions are, uh, this function are equal to zero. And then you can pass to a limit. If you can pass to a limit, then this function has contour integral zero, so it is analytic. So we want to check this property for these functions of ours. So we sum these three probabilities with coefficients one tau and tau squared. Now I uh, don't, uh, want to bore you, but this is exactly the picture which shows it. Uh, so what you do, you take some point and you look uh, at pictures where uh, your curve from one of the boundary points leads to first neighbor. And then you can always prolong it so that it leads to second neighbor to third neighbor. Or if there is a loop there, you can just change train tracks that it leads to first or second. So there are Basically, three different possibilities that you reach neighborhood of this point. You haven't been there. You reach neighborhood of this point, and there was a cycle there. And reach neighborhood of this point, and there was a curve relating to other points there. And each of them, there are three possibilities what you can do. And you, if you carefully plug them into this equation, you get that uh, in each case, you get 0. So basically, you use that the sum of cube roots of unity is equal to 0. And sum of squares of cube roots of unity is also equal to 0. So 1 plus tau plus tau square is 0. And 1 plus tau square tau to the power 4 is 0. Uh, so you get uh, that if your function, your function has contour integral 0, if it has a limit, uh, then it has contour integrals of 0. So it's analytic. Uh, why it has a limit? Well, that's false from Russo Seymour Welsh. You can show that some precompactness, Lipschitz, etc. Now, what are the boundary conditions? And the boundary conditions are rather funny. Suppose that z is on the bottom arc. You can connect it to A and C and B. You can connect it to B and A and C. But you cannot connect it to C, because then A cannot be connected to B. There is a topological abstraction. So on the arc AB, in this sum, you only will have HA plus tau HB. But uh, HA and HB and HC, they sum up to 1. So on this arc, the value of our function is a convex sum of 1 and tau. So what we get is that on this arc, our function is convex sum of 1 and tau. On the second arc, our function is convex sum of tau and tau squared. On the third arc, our function is sum, convex sum of 1 and tau squared. So we have an analytic function in a domain which maps three arcs to 1 tau, tau, tau squared, tau squared 1. 
by argument principle, it's exactly the conformal map. And hence goes the Carlson. And if you map to half plane, you get your favorite hypergeometric function. So this is, it's, it's really to the uh, point of being shameful because it's much, much shorter than what we had before. And now, um, how it's related to quantum things? Well, it's uh, percolation is logarithmic field theory, so it's, it's a bit uh, more mysterious for physicists. For Ising model, there is a very similar thing, but you have to take complex weight, so we have to have a disorder operator where you count the winding of the curve and you take uh, square root, so we get a fermion and essentially the very same procedure for Ising model with complex uh, uh, weight, it gives you a version of uh, Kaufman fermion or kadanov cheva fermion. Uh, so this is, uh, I think basically, this is just a proof how from it you can deduce cardi uh, how from it you can deduce a CLE and how you can do calculations with the CLE, but I don't have time about it to do to go about it. Now, uh, what uh, are the open questions? Uh, do something other than hexagonal layers. Well, do something in 3D. So 3D is wide open. So um, once again. Uh, uh, Hugo and Michael, they, Michael Esmond, Hugo Dimin, they have some beginnings of some things in 3D for the easing, but for the collision, it's really wide open, we tried very hard. And in physics, in 3D, uh, Slav Rechkov and others, they have a very interesting bootstrap for normalization where they have sort of physical method to compute all the expenses with arbitrary precision in a fairly, fairly direct way. And that can be probably mathematically made rigorous, but with a lot of work. Uh, and for this model, the interesting thing is, uh, well, that's the picture of renormalization. That's a percolation, that's a low temperature regime, which was done by Pistri Velenik. So the interesting thing, we know that uh, high temperature easy is percolation if you take uh, temperature infinite. But it should be percolation always. And that's, that's sort of a, well, maybe subject for 100, uh, what is the next anniversary, 120 or 110? Sorry? 200. 200. <laughs> 200. <laughs> 200. Yeah, well, 200. Well, that's the <laughs> Well, uh, 200, no. <laughs> okay, well, two, two, they made the next time, yeah. <laughs> So this is a deduction of uh, why you have a CLE6 uh, uh, if you know Cardi's formula. So there is a total probability formula which tells you that uh, uh, what you do, you run, you start running this tab to the slit till time t. And this slit, uh, if there is a crossing, if there is a crossing between these two arcs, like, like on the picture here I've drawn, then uh, it certainly goes around the slit because slit is yellow on one side, blue on another. So probability of having a crossing, which is given by Cardi formula for x over x minus y, it's uh, expected value of probability of crossing there, which you open the thing by conformal invariance, is probability of crossing between arcs till gt, gt is our function, and zero gt, which uh, you can uh, write as a Cardi formula of this. And gt, this map, uh, this Lobner map, is has expansion at infinity, so we plug in expansion at infinity, and uh, you get some formula which relates cardi x over x minus y, and cardi of x plus wt, which was the driving force. So in the end, uh, you get uh, cardi of x over x minus y is equal to expectation of cardi of this number, which uh, you expand hypergeometric function, 
and you get expectation of WT, expectation of WT minus 60 squared. So uh, since the two terms are equal, you get that this is zero and this is zero. So you get that WT, the driving force has, uh, is a Martingale, zero expectation of increments and square of increment has expectation 60. So it's a Brownian motion. So now uh, you see how you've got 660. Six uh, it's, it's because of, of the Cardi formula. If you, there was another formula, you put another number, and it's actually very much error checking. If you get the wrong formula, then you will see that it does not, uh, does not, does not work. And the quadratic four, uh, there is a quadratic thing built in. Essentially, it's built in because uh, there is a, this main thing of, uh, uh, of stochastic calculus that db square is dt. So if you have uh, something, for example, uh, if here some parameter increases as dB, then uh, when you square it, then you get another dT term. So for example, if you have like uh, a, a t is equal to a plus uh, b dT plus c dB, then uh, when, when you start, for example, playing like a t squared is a squared plus dot twice a b dT, but also you will get uh, plus c squared db squared. So these two things will be twice ab plus c squared dt. So this is just uh, to say that stochastic calculus and Laplacian, it has this uh, non-trivial non-linearity building, which uh, is easiest to explain by Newton lines. And uh, you can do this whole thing the other way around. You can start with the silly six where you know that uh, this parameter is six. And then you can uh, plug in Carti as an unknown function. And what you get, you get a PD for Carti's function. And then you can solve it, and you get hypergeometric function. So what happens for this PD if you change parameter 6? Nothing much. You just change one coefficient. Uh, and uh, it will be equally easy to solve it. No difference whatsoever. So what will happen at specific values uh, is that the structure of the space of solutions uh, will become slightly more algebraic. So you, you, all, all the functions will become nice, nicer. But, but it's uh, always hypergeometric, yes? Uh, well, in, for, for, for this particular one is always hypergeometric. It's this a conformal block. Yes, okay. yes, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, one, uh, one, one of the ways, of course, uh, how, how, how to do this thing, so it's, uh, you see what I, I draw this slit, and then, and then I open it up. So let's draw it. Uh, so what, what I was doing here, uh, so that it's easy, I draw it till time t, and see expansion at infinity. But you can draw it for time epsilon and six, but it's especially at a given point. So what you can do, you can take your half plane or a disk, you draw it for time epsilon, you sort of uh, expand and look what happens with vector fields on the circle. So that's 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 that will be your Rasor and and everything else. So there are I cannot say that uh, there are a couple of places uh, papers which try to bridge this gap and they say that we explain to physicists what mathematicians are doing, what mathematicians are doing to physicists, and they end up you know uh, it's like this job there are. Two, two kind of mathematics, mathematicians with respect to quantum field theory, those who don't understand it and those who understand what can it explain. So it's, it's uh, most of these uh, papers, uh, well, I had to read, well, I had to refer a couple of them and it's, it's usually you end up that uh, it's not a, but well, well it's, it's, it becomes like, it ends with adding more structure to understand. But uh, sort of there, there are some people who understand well, so, uh, well, Clement Angler would have a better, better was to say, okay, like it, also there are, there are a few people who understand very well. I have not seen it satisfactory, sort of really ground up, explained in a paper. But uh, I think I think now now it's, it's much much better understood. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, let's thank you. So the next question is around. T is uh, on the third floor today, so in room three, two, one. Ah, and coffee? And coffee in the same room. Ah. <laughs> as well as control. So how to get there? Uh, with the stairs. <laughs> so the same room as yesterday? No, 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 no. Se yesterday was, well, there's no room. It was second floor, so third floor. <laughs> oh, okay. 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 Okay.